This is CBC Here and Now. Normally we see a spike in fires uh, around this time of year. How to stop that and protect the ones you love. Another memorial for murdered women. How can the deaths be stopped? Angle it back. It's Is he going to pick it? Oh. Oh. Team Guju getting it done. Another win closer to the Olympics. Freezing rain warnings have just been issued for parts of the interior of the island. As a messy mix rolls in tonight, a mix to rain for most, but we'll have your full timeline coming up. A jury in Labrador has just returned with a verdict involving a well-known businessman whose family owned Air Labrador. Warwick Pike has been found guilty of sexual assault and sexual interference. Here now's Jacob Barker joins us live from outside the courthouse in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Jacob? Yeah, well, Anthony, that decision just came in moments ago, and there were cries of relief in that courtroom as that decision came down. I asked the woman who brought these charges against Pike uh, for her reaction to describe it in one word, and she said her reaction was closure. Uh, just so you get an idea of what the testimony was like over the past couple of days here in the courtroom, both sides gave differing accounts of two instances which happened about 15 years ago, over 15 years ago, where this sexual touching occurred. The woman said she often rode on a skidoo with Pike and was uncomfortable with the way he would hold her while he was riding. Uh, she said one day the touching was so bad she intentionally crashed the skidoo to make it stop. Pike said that the touching was not sexual in nature and that he did not hold her because she... She held her because she was very small at the time and she drove very fast. In another instance, the woman said that he reached over and touched her sexually while he was teaching her to drive a truck. Pike said that never happened, but he does recall having she had the tendency to use the wrong foot to brake and he may have slapped her on the leg to get her to stop her from doing that. Uh, she said later he, he told her not to tell anybody because it could ruin his business and it could cause his partner to leave him. Pike denied that that conversation ever happened, but the jury came back tonight and unanimously uh, convicted Pike of all three of these charges. He has been released, but he is due to come back on Friday for sentence, for, to set a date for sentencing. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. Still with court matters, the jury is still out at the Brandon Phillips first-degree murder trial. The six men and six women began deliberating yesterday afternoon, but have not yet reached a verdict. Here now's Fred Hutton has been at Supreme Court all day, and he joins us live from outside the courthouse. Fred. Anthony, all is quiet inside the courthouse right now. The jury spent about seven hours today deliberating, but still unable to reach a verdict on whether or not Brandon Phillips is guilty or innocent of first-degree murder. The jurors began discussing the case at 9.30 this morning. By 3 o'clock this afternoon, lawyers were summoned back to the court to hear a question from the jury. Members of the media, in an unusual move, were not permitted in the courtroom to hear that question. But we can tell you that whatever the question was, it won't be answered until tomorrow morning. After spending about an hour behind closed doors, the judge, jury and lawyers all emerged and we were told that the jurors were sent home at about 4.30 and won't return to the court until tomorrow morning at 9.30. So that means another night for the jury sequestered at a local hotel with no access to TV, radio or internet. Now members of Larry Wellman's family, his uh, wife, his daughter, his son were here today hoping to hear some uh, news about a major development but like everybody else we will have to wait until at least tomorrow for a verdict. Reporting live from Supreme Court for Here and Now, Fred Hutton, CBC News, St. John's. Muskrat Falls is years behind schedule, billions over budget, and taxpayers are on the hook. But the law that governs Nalcorp means those taxpayers aren't currently allowed to know how much contractors working on Muskrat Falls get paid. That's according to a report issued today by information and privacy watchdog Donovan Malloy. Malloy wrote that those consequences may have been unintended, something that could be fixed by a change in the legislation. Premier Dwight Ball says that's going to happen soon. To get this done as quickly as possible. I, I would anticipate that this is something that we could get in place for the spring setting, but I can't make that commitment right now until we get more details and the information that's required. 
Tonight we take you to the small southwest coast town of Isla Mort. The hub of the community could soon close. La Gallus Memorial is one of the schools under review by the province's school board and parents and students aren't happy about that news. Here now is Colleen Connors has more. No, it's not quitting time, just lunch hour. Every one of the 47 students at La Gallus Memorial goes home for something to eat. Well, you won't get to come home and get lunch. Jesse is in a class of 15 students, grades 5, 6 and 7. A new school in a bigger town scares him. Yeah, you won't get as much help because you're in a class with 30 people instead of just 15. Usually your teacher can help you in a small school, but in a bigger school you wouldn't get that help. The English school district could close the school by September 2018. Students could then have to travel to Port Basque or nearby Burnt Islands by bus each day. They gave us two options of going to Port Basque or going to Burnt Islands to take our kids. But instead, the parents are fighting over whether they want our kids to go to which school they want, other than trying to fight to keep our school keep open. Because it feels like we weren't given that option of keeping our school open. Right. Do you feel they jumped the gun? They do. They, yeah. yes. yes, they did, big time. And we were wondering, like, why the Gallus? Like, why These two moms worry their children will go unnoticed. They get a lot of extra help being a smaller group of kids. I feel mm -hmm. if they move to a bigger school, then that's the help they're not going to get. I mean, they're going to be a number in a classroom right now. They're, everybody knows everybody. Exactly. It's a family school. It is. The Big Red School is tucked in the center of this outpour community of fishing boats. If the school closes, Isla Mort could crumble. Uh, as mayor of the town, that it's, it could have an effect on whether people are going to move here or people that are here, are they going to move out? For now, Jesse will still go home for lunch and his mom will bring him back before the bell rings. And the community will hang on to their community school just a little longer. It's true that no decisions have been made just yet. There will be a vote to keep the school open or closed in February. And the community says they will do everything in their power to try to keep Legalis open. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Isla Mort. It's a pretty spot. Uh, yeah. It was a pretty day today, actually. I managed to go for a very rare December bike ride this morning. That's so, so unusual, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, tomorrow it'll be mild enough for that bike ride, but you'll want your uh, rain gear on as uh, we have showers tracking in. Uh, messy mix though before it gets to this neck of the woods is we have uh, already some warnings in place. Let's have a look at the board and you can see where we have freezing rain warnings issued for Buckins in the interior, Deer Lake, the Humber Valley and Green Bay, White Bay. This is going to be the area where that freezing rain will hang on for a good portion of the evening into the overnight and again we'll really start to ice things up. Some snow mixed with rain uh, by the time we get to, towards tomorrow morning. Wind warnings are still in effect for the west coast gusts to 100 kilometers per hour there and snowfall warnings are still in effect for the Labrador side of the Straits where totals could add up to about 15 centimeters. There's a look at the latest radar again that snow just starting to track into central parts of Newfoundland some of those flakes over the next uh, couple of hours and then that will uh, that mess will really start to track in again over the next uh, three four hours and watch your timeline here. Note that temperatures are going to rise along the west coast. It's a change to rain first along areas of the coast, if not already, and then through the overnight into tomorrow morning. That mix to rain for most areas. There's still some snow likely early on tomorrow morning for the Baybert Peninsula, Northern Peninsula, and note that snow will start to taper off to some flurries in southeastern parts of Labrador as well. For St. John's and the Avalon, that rain arrives overnight tonight uh, with some scattered showers through the morning. I think the, some of those steadier showers possible uh, through the afternoon tomorrow temperatures rise in the east, fall throughout the day in the west and even into central by late afternoon. And we'll of course have a full timeline coming up with your next three days in just a few minutes. Anthony. Thank you, Ryan. It was 28 years ago that a burst of gunfire in Montreal's Ecole Polytechnique Engineering School abruptly ended the lives of 14 female students. They were remembered today in a silent tribute. Officials observed a moment of contemplation and reflection in both the House of Commons and in Quebec's National Assembly. The Prime Minister is in China, where he too set aside some time to reflect on the lives lost on this day back in 1989. 
Here in Canada, at the end of the day, the Prime Minister's wife, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, will join a gathering on Montreal's Mount Royal for a special ceremony. And later this evening, 14 lights will be beamed into the sky above the city in memory of the young women who were killed. There's also a vigil happening at Memorial University tonight to remember what happened 28 years ago. Here now is Karen Stokes is there and she will have a live report coming up in about 30 minutes. A supersized visitor has left Happy Valley Goose Bay. This Air France A380 finally headed home after two months at the Goose Bay Airport. It made an emergency landing after one engine blew apart over Greenland. That engine was replaced, tested, and the plane was allowed to leave. The investigation into what caused the emergency is still underway. The good news, the plane just landed safely in Paris a couple of minutes ago. There is confirmation tonight that an RNC officer is being investigated for a possible sexual assault. The Nova Scotia Serious Incident Response Team, or CERT, is looking into the complaint against the male officer. The head of CERT Nova Scotia says the alleged incident happened several years ago. The RNC says it received a complaint from the woman this past summer. Uh, officers from the Halifax Regional Police Force were in Newfoundland in September and conducted interviews. The investigation is continuing. It is the second time this week that there's been confirmation of an RNC officer being investigated. On Monday, it was learned that the conduct of Constable Joe Smythe was being looked into by the Alberta Serious Incident Response Team. Smythe was the centre of a lengthy inquiry over the fatal shooting of Don Dunphy. Smythe is under investigation by CERT Alberta following a complaint about how he handled a traffic stop in May. They were in the house just yesterday uh, debating uh, our CERT bill and I think it speaks to the importance right now of, of having this own legislation in our province, having this own team here available in this province. One of the issues that we are facing is it's getting harder and harder to have this kind of work done uh, by going to outside sources. They have their own work to do, uh, their own resources are tight. Uh, so I don't want a situation where we need something to be investigated and we can't get it investigated. Uh, we've been lucky so far, but that's gonna, that will run out at some point. A small woodworking shop is having a big impact in Maine where people are gaining confidence and motivation while learning new skills. The Maine Community Shed opened in February as a one-year pilot project and it includes the tools to tackle projects ranging from simple benches to chairs, tables and the more ambitious skin-on-frame traditional kayaks. The shed is run by Nunatsia Boots Department of Health and Social Development and the doors are open to anyone 10 or older who wants to try their hand at wood working. Program coordinator Neil Hawk says the program provides a healthy place for people to hang out and they can develop skills, confidence and motivation at the same time. Sounds like a great program. I wouldn't mind that, especially the kayak part. Uh, yeah. I like one of those kayaks. <laughs> Today burn completely different than they did 20 years ago. We'll tell you why that is and how to protect your family.
It seems inevitable at this time of year that we often seem to hear about fire tragedies. In fact, in the last 12 hours alone, there have been two fires on the Avalon Peninsula. We're joined by someone who fights fires and who promotes fire safety. Vince McKenzie is the fire chief in Grand Falls, Windsor. Welcome to Here and Now. How are you doing? Excellent. Now, is it just me or do we see an uptick in house fires this time of year? No, actually, uh, we do see house fires, of course, all year long, but uh, more prevalent in the wintertime. We will see uh, more houses involving or, uh, with fire. Sorry. So what is it that, what causes that? Okay, so normally what happens is uh, in the winter months, we're heating our, our homes, of course, with heating appliances, whether that would be oil or electricity or also wood-burning appliances. And also we, uh, we use a lot of electricity in the wintertime as well because the lights are, it's darker, and uh, we require more heating appliances. So uh, normally we see a, spur, a spike in, uh, in fires uh, around this time of year. I want to talk to you just a bit about the, the challenge, the modern challenge of fighting fires because of the new stuff that's in our houses. But you had a fire recently in your town? Yeah, just Friday night, actually, we had a house fire here involving uh, a wall that was uh, caught on fire by, uh, by uh, a fireplace, actually. The, the wall above the fireplace had ignited inside the wall. So, yeah, it's, it's very common, and we, we normally see those type of fires, uh, you know, around November right up to February. And once you get inside these houses or the walls and you have to fight these fires, Vince, what are some of the challenges because of the modern things that we all want to have inside our houses these days? Well, really what we're seeing now, of course, is fires today burn completely different than they did 20 years ago. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because our homes are much more airtight and we've uh, insulated them really well so they retain air and heat really well. But also we have uh, lighter construction of homes as well and that causes the, uh, the fires to uh, penetrate the, the walls and, and that, those kind of things quickly. And also what we put in our homes, the combustibility of our furnishings. And uh, if you think about, for example, in your bedroom, 20 years ago in your bedroom, you might have had a clock radio, you might have had a TV, but if you look around a typical bedroom now, we see a lot of electronics, we see cell phones and computers and battery chargers, not to mention the clock radio and the TVs and the VCR and PVRs and all those kind of things. But we also see uh, our combustibility of our mattresses and our linens, actually. It's completely different than it was 25, 30 years ago because a lot of the mattresses we see now are actually made out of foams and types of plastics, which burn very fast. So uh, we're seeing a change in the behavior of fires uh, in, in homes in right. general, but most, more so in, in the bedrooms and living rooms. All right, so the materials present a challenge because of their combustibility, as you put it. What about the causes? Exactly. When we look at wiring, for instance, in houses and, and all of those gadgets that you mentioned, do we just have too much juice running through our houses that maybe can't handle it at times? Yeah, absolutely. we uh, we got to be careful with electricity more than ever now, even though we have uh, light bulbs, of course, that use a lot more, a lot less electricity. But people have the use of extension cords and power bars and those kind of things. And you should never, for example, hook up a space heater to any kind of an extension cord. A space heater is designed to work directly off the outlet. So we see uh, overloading of circuits in, in those kind of uh, circumstances as well. And also the amount of electrical uh, appliances that we have in our home now, everything seems like it's uh, run by electricity. And you had to be very careful to maintain the wires and the, uh, and the uh, like I say, the extension cords and those kind of things. Right. You also had to be very, very careful with space heaters. Portable space heaters need space. And we see a lot of fires involving those where people place them too close, for example, to the couch or to the drapes. All right, so be careful with your extra heaters. Last question for you, Vince. What's the one message you hope people take away from seeing you tonight on Here and Now? Well, one thing about uh, fire safety is we always got to make sure that we, uh, we have our homes protected with working smoke alarms, and we need to have a working smoke alarm on every level of our home. And also, it's now required in, in Newfoundland since 2012 to have a working smoke alarm in every sleeping room. So that means you have a working smoke alarm in every bedroom and every room where somebody sleeps. So it's very important that you have a, a, a smoke alarm and also you practice and actually practice a family escape plan because young children, if they don't actually practice it, will hide in an emergency, mm -hmm. but they remember what they've done if they've practiced it. So I urge all families to practice a home escape plan and actually do the drill in their own home. All right, Vince. Well, I have a lot of work to do in my own house after talking to you tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. Appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. It's Vince McKenzie, Fire Chief in Grand Falls, Windsor. Up next, a second contender for the leadership of the PC party comes forward.
see it in 70 millimeter Thursday. Well, here's a beautiful picture uh, taken by Gail Flowers. Uh, the Northern Lights and, of course, don't miss Santa's sleigh there, uh, taken in Postville this week. Santa has a light to guide him there. Nice. <laughs> it's beautiful. Gorgeous. Just parked in the Northern Lights. You don't see too many places where you can do that. No, <laughs> definitely not. Uh, beautiful shot. Thanks to Gail and to everybody who's been posting some great pics on my Facebook page. Speaking of Labrador, Snow has been tracking in there last night and through the day today, certainly on the lower end of uh, some of the snowfall projections and uh, uh, that snow will continue to taper off through tonight. You can see based on the webcams, there's a little bit of snow there. Uh, again, certainly a dark shot as it is now dark, but uh, you can see the snow banks. Uh, certainly, uh, again, added to today and into tonight in Happy Valley Goose Bay, where the temperature right now is zero. Winds are in from the south, uh, sustained near 33 kilometers per hour, so a little on the breezy side as well with this system coming in. Snowfall warnings continue for the Straits and the Labrador side of things. Wind warnings still in effect for the west coast, uh, all the way from the Daniels Harbor region down towards Port of Basque. Coastal gusts this evening in the 100 kilometer per hour range. Rackhouse in the gusting near 120, uh, continuing for the next couple of hours. Freezing rain warnings, Buckins the interior, Deer Lake, the Humber Valley, and the Green Bay, White Bay area. As this warm sector works in throughout the overnight, temperatures will rise closer to towards tomorrow morning. It's an eventual mix over to some rain, bit of wet snow, because temperatures won't climb too much above zero, but that freezing rain will come to an end through, through the overnight. And again, the best chance is certainly through that Humber Valley region uh, and into those low lying areas where it'll take longer for that warmer air to sink in. Uh, already seeing rain in Port of Basque and down towards the Port of Port Peninsula. Coastal areas, it is going to be mainly a rain event here. It's just those higher elevation areas where it will take longer, including the Corner Brook region. And we could even see a slushy five centimeters of snow, the Bayvert Peninsula, the Northern Peninsula. There's that snow continuing to track through the Happy Valley Goose Bay region through tonight and into tomorrow morning. Uh, still a little bit of light snow, Northern Peninsula and Southeastern Labrador, but the snow starts to taper off as we work throughout that morning. So temperatures, a mild start, four degrees in Corner Brook and Port Basque, likely two or three degrees for Eastern parts of Newfoundland as well. Minus 10 in Labrador City. That's the cold air knocking on the door and it will sweep back in to Western parts of Newfoundland with temperatures falling through the day. Chance of a scattered flurry here. Uh, also a temperature drop for places like Badger, Gander, really not until around the late afternoon, supper time will you start to see your temps fall. And St. John's, it's going to be a damp day across the Avalon, Bonavista, and uh, even the Buren Peninsula with rain for much of the day. And temperatures are going to be in that 5 to 6 degree range with winds in from the south, gusting in the 50 kilometer per hour range. We will see as the temperatures fall, a bit of clearing and even some sunshine starting to break through, but do watch for the possibility of a scattered flurry coming off the Gulf of St. Lawrence as winds come in from the west. And we are going to be seeing sun and cloud for most of Labrador with that messy mix in the morning tapering off into the afternoon. Now watch your timeline here as we roll into the Friday time period. It's a weak disturbance that's going to be tracking in enough though to spark up some flurries in western Newfoundland Friday morning. Those will push into central Newfoundland if you have some Friday afternoon plans. St. John's and the Avalon, the I think we will see some Friday afternoon, late and evening showers, maybe even a wet flurry mixing in with temperatures around that three, four degree range. We're going to be closer to the freezing mark central and western parts of Newfoundland on Friday. Friday is smooth sailing in Labrador and under a mix of sun and cloud. It's a cool one, but a nice one. Now for Friday night into Saturday, bit of a break, and then our next little system starts to move in. This is on the leading edge. It's kind of a one-two punch, and the first wave comes through on Saturday. Yes, that is snow for the Avalon, St. John's, central parts of Newfoundland, although I do think we mix over to some rain into the afternoon. And a juicier shot coming in for the Sunday time period with more snow, more rain, especially for the east, potentially heavy rain for Sunday and potentially uh, accumulating snow for central and west. We'll leave it at that, and we'll talk more about that setup coming up in your long-range forecast. Debbie? Thanks, Ryan. The latest man who wants to lead the Tories has no political experience, but Placentia native Tony Wakeham has an impressive background, health management, private business, and even national basketball. Here now is Terry Roberts has our story. Working the room as an aspiring politician, this is something new for Tony Wakeham. But the former CEO of Labrador Grenfell Health believes he's the man to rebuild the PC party and lead it back to power before the next election in 2019. 
it's taken me a long time to get to today because obviously this is not something you just simply wake up and decide to do. Wakeham launched his campaign in Portugal Cove St. Phillips Tuesday night. About 80 supporters, with some familiar names leading his campaign. I always said it would take someone really special to take me out of retirement and back into the, to a role like this. Uh, and Tony is that person. I think he has a great ability after being a leader at a provincial and national level of a number of organizations to be able to bring that team spirit here and be able to revitalize the PC party. A political newcomer. His entry into the race is setting the stage for a showdown with lawyer Chess Crosby. I'm going to focus on my connections, my experience, my public service record and the fact that I think I bring a unique set of uh, characteristics to this campaign and the fact that I have lived in all areas of our province. There's not too many people can say that. As someone who's worked in healthcare management, how would he address what some are calling a monumental challenge? He's not offering specifics, but there were some hints. We've got a heavy focus on acute care, not enough focus on community care. So let's focus, not just saying a buzzword of community health, let's make communities healthy. And in order to do that, we've got to change the model. Wakeham now has five months to convince party supporters he's the man for the job. But he's already convinced this woman. Knowing Tony for a good number of years, I'm, I'm pretty positive about the outlook. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, he's going to be a strong candidate. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. The St. John's Edge were back on the court at mile one last night, and while there was a nerve-rattling fourth quarter that saw the teams exchange leads get this six times, the home team managed to pull out a victory. The Edge beat the London Lightning 126 to 123. Newfoundland's Carl English nailed his final two shots with 11 seconds left to secure the victory. The Edge wrap up their four-game homestand tonight at mile one, once again facing London. Well, Team Guizhou eked out another win. Have a look. All the pressure was on Skip Brad, Brad Guizhou last night in the fifth end. He had no room for error on this shot. Final stone, Guizhou. Hard, her with him. Angle it back. Is he going to pick it? Oh, And that's why he's the current world champion. Team Guizhou now 3-2. and They're on the ice again at 8.30 Island time, taking on Team McEwen from Manitoba. Wow, that that was amazing. But every game is a tough one. Yeah, yeah especially at that, that uh, at that level. What a brilliant shot. <laughs> wow. Remembering the victims of Ecole Polytechnique. And fighting to stop violence against women right here.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Today marks 28 years since 14 young women were killed at Montreal's École Polytechnique. It remains the deadliest mass shooting in Canadian history. Tonight, a vigil is being held at Memorial University's Engineering Building. Here and Now's Carolyn Stokes is joining us now live. Carolyn, tell us about the vigil. Well, Debbie, it's happening right now behind these closed doors. Dozens of people have gathered to remember the 14 young women, most of them engineering students, who were gunned down in a Montreal classroom in 1989. Now, the reason for the mass murder was gender. The women were killed because they were women. And tonight, in this vigil, each of their names will be read aloud. Candles will be lit in their honor. They are being remembered. Now, one of the speakers here tonight is Mary Shortle. She's the president of the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor. Now, she says for her, this tragedy marked the beginning of a much bigger conversation. I spoke with her a short time ago. So, Ms. Shortle, you're speaking here tonight. Uh, what sorts of things were going through your mind as you were preparing what you're going to say? Well, it was, it's, it's a whole bunch of different things because I remember in 1989 when that happened. I was a brand new activist and I was trying to define myself as a feminist and, and it was a horrific, uh, a horrific incident. But even more so than that were, and I'll talk a little bit about it tonight, were the discussions that happened after. You know, was it someone who was a madman? Was it something, you know, because they were women or could it just have been something else? And that uh, conversation, in 28 years ago was the beginning of a conversation around uh, male violence against women. And I think it was a turning point for me uh, because it, because part of what I do now is to talk about that issue from a societal point of view. It's not the act of a madman to come in and shoot 14 women after calling them feminists and separating them. But today, in you know 2017, in Newfoundland and Labrador, we're among the highest rates of uh, intimate partner violence in the country. Wow. One in two women in Newfoundland and Labrador will experience violence uh, in her lifetime, which is staggering, right? And uh, from a workplace point of view, one in three workers um, has witnessed or has uh, experienced domestic violence in their work life. So, you know, as a union representative now, and as a feminist and an activist, um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, and in light, especially in light of the, the Me Too now that we're seeing, what is it we need to do? So, uh, we need to do work as individuals, obviously. We need to, you know, in the Federation of Labor, we do broader political work to try and change the inequality that exists between women and men in our society. Uh, but we also have to challenge ourselves, I think, and we have to challenge men to actually start to step up to the plate and do, we really need to work together to do something. And you know, th this vigil is held every year, but this year truly does feel different. You mentioned the Me Too campaign. Um, you know, what's your sense of how things are changing right now? Well, more and more people are speaking out. That's really good. But it can't just be the women speaking out to say, this is what's happened to me. Men really need to rise to the task. And governments, uh, policymakers, decision makers, unions, employers, everyone has to rise to the task. So there's a couple of things happening. I mean, we see in our province in the last several months, you know, three women who've been murdered by their intimate partners. Uh, we really need to start to talk about how we're going to change that culture that makes that okay. So I have to look at myself and say, have I been complicit in this? Do I, am I silent sometimes? You know, even in the position I'm in, there's probably times when I've just let some stuff slide. And so we have to make sure that, you know, we're cognizant of that and that we, when women women say I've been harassed, that we believe them and that we work with employers and government to put policies in place. As a Federation of Labor, we've been, and working in the broader community, we've been working with governments around domestic violence at work legislation. 
which changes employment standards so that all workers hopefully will be able to uh, get paid time off uh, when they experience domestic violence. Uh, we're also working around occupational health and safety so that in a workplace where domestic violence happens, and it happens in workplaces, uh, that um, not just the person who's been the victim of domestic violence, but all the workers in the workplace can be protected and that there's measures put in place. Um, in our unions, we bargain you know, women's advocates, we bargain collective bargaining, uh, you know, collective language around education and awareness, harassment policies and stuff. But it really is, like I said before, it really has to be a concerted effort from you know, organizations, employers, governments, individuals, men uh, together because there is a culture here. It's a societal issue. It's a political issue. There needs to be political change, political will to change it, but there also needs to be um, a concerted effort to change the culture of, as they call it, toxic masculinity, where it's, uh, it's accepted in our culture, and we do need to change that. Right, Mary Shortle, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. And that was Mary Shortle of the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor. And as she talked about, violence against women in this province is an ever-present issue, one that was highlighted recently at another vigil for missing and murdered women. At that vigil, 117 names were read out loud. And since that time, even more names have been added to that list, including three women who were murdered in this province in the past six months. Reporting live from Memorial University, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. It's kind of hard for me to grasp that it was 28 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I was a brand new anchor at Here and Now. I'd only been on the job about a month or so. I'll never forget that night and the coverage of it. It was a bit confusing in the beginning. Yeah. Nobody could quite believe no. that the women were targeted, but as we know, that yeah, is what it was, happened. It was horrific. I was going to university at McGill, but I lived very close to the Ecole Polytechnique and the number of sirens and trucks and police, you knew something horrible had happened. And then when the pictures emerged and you realize that these people have been killed because they're females, it was, uh, it was a shocking night for the country. Absolutely. Remembering the deadly blast that leveled Halifax. Dunkirk. 
see it in 70 millimeter Thursday. The Avalon Mall from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. taking your donations and wrapping your gifts. Here and now we'll be broadcasting live from 6 to 7 here at the mall and it's sure to be a special show with performances by the Shalloway Choir. So we hope you can join us here at the Avalon Mall this Friday. It's sure to be a great day, isn't it, Giver? It sure is, Ryan. How did you do that? It's Christmas magic. Huh. Let's meet our young athlete of the day. This would be Chantel Hurley of Mount Moriah. She's 11 and has a love for gymnastics since she was 18 months old. Started young. Uh, Chantel trains at Salto's Gymnastics Club in Cornerbrook and is currently completing level six. Way to go. You're today's young athlete of the day. That's great. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Glad you changed, by the way. Yeah, so. well, you know, i got to save that suit for Friday. Yeah. But uh, let me tell you, if you ever want to get some looks at the mall, <laughs> put that on yeah. and start walking around. Uh, just a few You didn't people. scare any children, though, did you? No. <laughs> Not no, like Santa sometimes. No. Actually, the kids loved it, but uh, the, uh, one woman came up and said, you know, you shouldn't wear your pajamas in the mall. Uh. <laughs> But uh, I, she was joking, and I think she knew it was a very nice uh, tailored suit, of course. Uh, not. Uh, but anyway, looking forward to Friday, Feed NL Day. And again, uh, we're there from 11 to 7, wrapping gifts. So hopefully you can stop by. Mm -hmm. And this show will be there from 6 yeah. to 7. And not only that, but Ryan and I, we're doing crosstalk on radio right across the province that day, too. So if you happen to be at the mall on the lunch period, drop on by, say hi. We're going to be busy. Busy day, yeah. for Very sure. Busy. You're going to get the mileage of that suit. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, and weather-wise, the good news is for traveling Friday, a few showers to deal with here in the east, but nothing too, too significant. A few flurries uh, in uh, western and central parts of Newfoundland. It's the weekend that's looking unsettled. How about that temperature contrast? Four degrees right now in Atlanta, 26 in Orlando. Is that a cold front? That's a cold front. And uh, as we pop on the satellite and radar, there is the front. And that is some cold air for this time of year that far south. Even some snow mixing in over the southeast parts of the U.S. over the next day or so as that front kind of stalls out there. And we see a couple of lows develop along that line. That'll be our weekend setup moving into our neck of the woods. And I'll... Uh, Give you your timeline in just a second. Again, on the leading edge of this, it's some snow changing to freezing rain, then over to some rain across the uh, western into central parts of Newfoundland by tomorrow morning. In case you missed it, here's a quick look at the next three with temperatures again on the rise. Five degrees in the east tomorrow. Uh, some showers, flurries in the mix for Friday as temperatures back to the freezing mark in the west. Still above zero here in the east. And Saturday, again, we'll talk about that in a second where we will see a bit of a messy mix across the island. Labrador really kind of calming down over the next couple days. Certainly some flurries in the mix, uh, but uh, overall a quieter pattern. So back to the weekend and here is that Saturday setup. Potential certainly for some snow for the Avalon central parts of Newfoundland, but I think it's a light snow at that, but certainly the chance for some accumulation with that. Uh, any accumulation though looks set to be wiped out as uh, that first little wave moves off and our next bigger low comes in. And this is the timing right now. Saturday night, snow builds in from the south. I think it's a change to rain uh, certainly through Sunday morning across the Avalon and the Beeren Peninsulas. Central Newfoundland accumulating snow here. Too early to say just how much. The track is going to be key, but the potential for accumulating snow certainly for central western parts of Newfoundland change to rain through Sunday afternoon and then from Cornerbrook up towards the northern peninsula southeastern Labrador this looks like a mainly snow event with a heavy rain potential here for the Avalon the Buren and maybe Bonavista as well forecast models really uh, throwing uh, quite a bit of rain into the mix by the time this is all said and done on Monday. Again, too early speci for specifics in terms of totals here, but this is general looking like the setup where I do think we could see some light snow, but the main story here is going to be the heavy rain for Sunday into Sunday night, even into Monday, possibly for the Avalon and eastern parts of Newfoundland. Snow changing to rain in central. Again, we'll nail down totals uh, in the next uh, 24 to 48, and we are looking at that mostly snow uh, for the northern peninsula into southeastern parts of Labrador. Not uh, out, not even out of the question that with that heavy rain, we'll see the potential for some double digits at 10, 11, maybe even 12 degrees Sunday here across eastern Newfoundland. Temperatures fall through Monday. You can see minus two in the west, four on, in the east. We kind of level the playing field a little bit Tuesday with another 
possible warm push for Wednesday of next week, uh, followed by a cold push late week as the roller coaster ride of December continues. And there are those, uh, again, quiet pattern through Labrador with the potential for some snow uh, late Sunday into Monday. The so-called silence breakers have been named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. The magazine cover features some of the women who are talking about sexual assault and harassment. Never have envisioned something that would be that would change the world. I was trying to change my community. I thought, you know, if if women could just come forward and say me too. The silence breakers have prompted many women to come forward with allegations of sexual misconduct against some high profile men in entertainment and media. Hundreds of people gathered at Fort Needham Park in Halifax this morning to mark the centennial anniversary of the Halifax explosion. Two ships collided during the First World War and the blast vaporized much of the north end of the city. 2,000 people were killed and today their ancestors traveled from across North America to pay tribute. Carolyn Ray reports. A sea of umbrellas under a gray sky. Hundreds gather to mark the moment the Mont Blanc blew up on Halifax's shore, scarring the city forever. The moment of silence will begin and end with the striking of the ship's bell. Silence and then poetry, as Canada's poet laureate channels the grief and tells the story of what happened. But Vince Coleman, alert, alarmed, Tap so urgent, percussive morse, ammo ship in harbor is fixing for Pier 6. It was the most deadly man-made explosion until Hiroshima. 2,000 were killed instantly. An entire part of the city was flattened. Homes collapsed and then burned. And I'm going to tell you, out of that devastation, we are sitting in one of the most modern, vibrant cities in this country. And it's because our ancestors, on the day after, in the middle of a snowstorm, got up and said, we're going to repair what was damaged. We're going to put this city back together. Very moving for us, yeah. very emotional. In this crowd, everyone has a story, a connection to that horrible day. We live on a street, believe it or not, that has the anchor of the Mont Blanc that, you know, five, ten kilometers was blown that day a hundred years ago. So it's very close to us. Wearing red, the Jackson family came from across North America to be here. The Jacksons suffered the biggest loss. 46 family members died. It's very emotional. You know, I keep thinking 100 years ago uh, what it was like here. What were they thinking their life before? And nobody knew what was coming. 100 years ago, Halifax was desperately searching for survivors. Today, this city is making sure their efforts aren't forgotten. Carolyn Ray, CBC News, Halifax. A Toronto man went on a remarkable search and rescue mission after his bike was stolen. Lauren Pelly has the story about the bicycle's wild ride halfway around the world. Her name is Tiffany a $3,000 mountain bike painted bright Tiffany blue. Thieves snatched her from Warren Hull's condo in March. They broke this lock open. Tiffany was gone. Our storage locker had been broken into and they had taken her. Security footage shows two men wheeling her out of the building, but Hull knew they couldn't actually ride the bike. A key part of the wheel was missing. So he called around to bike shops to see if anyone had bought the part. So I got a name and it was just too coincidental. So through social media, through Facebook, Instagram, I searched and searched. And he found a suspect, someone with the same name as the man who bought the part, with a mountain bike in his Facebook photo. That same man later put up Tiffany's pedals for sale. So that was another, I guess, jab in the heart because now he's selling parts off. Another Facebook post revealed he also shipped off the rest of the bike overseas. I mean, I found it, but it's in the Philippines. Now, like, it's gone. Like, now it's gone. But there was a happy ending. With the help of a Filipino mountain bike group, Hull pushed the man to ship her back. And he did, seven months after Tiffany first vanished. She went on a bit of a journey, and she's, she's back. So one big question remains, who actually stole Warren's bike? He doesn't believe the man who brought it back was actually one of the two men he saw in his security footage. So that question might remain a mystery. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto.
All right, after that show tonight, I'm hiring that guy. Russian President Vladimir Putin says he will not stand in the way of individual Russian athletes who want to compete under the Olympic flag at the Winter Games in Pyeongchang, South Korea. The International Olympic Committee yesterday banned the Russian team and the Russian anthem from the upcoming games over doping violations at the 2014 Games in Sochi. But Olympic officials signaled that individual Russians with clean doping records would be allowed to take part as neutral competitors. That raised the possibility of Putin blocking their participation as a protest against the ban of Russia as a nation. Today, in the midst of announcing that he will seek re-election in Russia, Putin said individual Russian athletes could go ahead and take part. All right, today's viewer picture of the day. Now, don't let the snow fool you. This is an oldie but a goodie. This was taken last April, and it was taken on the island. April. Can you guess what river that Humber is? Humber Valley. Humber. Good guess, but no. Oh. Exploits. <laughs> <laughs> Don't spoil it for everyone, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Well, was this your viral moment of the year? Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my! 2017 is winding down, and that means we've been getting our first taste of year-end lists. This video out of Richmond, BC, certainly made a splash. Big close encounter between a sea lion and a young girl that topped YouTube's trending video list for the year in Canada. The girl was okay. I remember this came out. Uh, largely thanks to that quick thinking of the man who jumped in after her. And the startling footage brought in more than 30 million views. Oh my goodness. Oh my God. Oh my God. Wow. And that man did not waste any time, right? Right in there as fast as you could be, right? So you could say this university in Taiwan has been on a bit of a lucky streak. It's claiming a world record for the longest lasting rainbow recorded anywhere in the world, clocking in at nearly nine hours. Oh, there must have been a big pot of gold at the end of that one. <laughs> a professor of atmospheric science at the university is compiling thousands of photos of the event into a rainbow clock to send to the Guinness World Records Committee. If it's confirmed, it would beat the current record, which is held in Sheffield, England, by almost uh, three hours. Oh, that's spectacular. That's great. 
Yeah. You're very practical though, Debbie. You went right to the size of the <laughs> pot of gold at the end of that sucker. <laughs> Dreaming, just yeah. dreaming. Help now pay they, for the Christmas shopping. Yeah, yesterday. that's right. That's right. They may hold the record for the longest rainbow, but I think as far as fog bows go, with uh, I think Newfoundland must hold the record there. Yeah. Unofficial. Yeah, at the end of that is a big pot of bills. <laughs> <laughs> Not Nobody touching that one. That. <laughs> now, as we take a look at our viewer picture of the day, uh, Anthony, you nailed it uh, before the break. Uh, this is the Exploits River and a beautiful shot. Now, unfortunately, I didn't actually get uh, an exact location. Also, during the commercial break, Anthony was wondering, is that a good spot for salmon fishing, I wonder? <laughs> How about the GPS coordinates of those lodges there? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, again, not exactly sure where on the exploits, but uh, somewhere in that neck of the woods in central parts of Newfoundland, you can see Andrew. Thank you very much for sharing that. Obviously took that with a drone. Uh, and that was taken in April. I love how much snow wow. is on the wow. ground. Wherever it is, I would love to see it mm. firsthand. Yeah, thanks very much, Andrew. With a rod. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye now. Am I doing it right? <laughs> no. We'll get you there. Sort of. <laughs>